Welcome back to today's video. Today is Wednesday, October 16th, 2024, and today we are going to be talking about the weird but possible and potentially likely 2024 electoral college map that we might see on November 6th, 2024, as the results pour in across battleground states that will determine the future not only of the presidency, but likely of the United States of America. The 2024 election has long been watched as one of the closest states, uh, not states, elections we have seen this century, potentially even closer than the year 2000, in which we saw an electoral college victory of just 271 electoral votes for the Republican candidate there then, uh, George W. Bush, uh, to Al Gore's uh, 267. The 2024 race has also been one that has been surrounded by controversy, surrounded by media scandal and speculation on both sides of the aisle. Many major stories in and out of the press, uh, multiple debates with two different sets of candidates all around here, a 2024 election that is really shaping up to be quite interesting from the perspective of an outside viewer. And I think what we've come to know about the polls is that they are quite literally all over the place. One thing, though, has remained consistent, and we've talked about this pretty often, is that the national numbers really haven't fluctuated since the beginning of August of 2024. On August 1st, Kamala Harris maintained an advantage of 1.2% nationally. By the end of that week, she had risen it to a two-point lead, and we saw since then she has not dipped below a two-point lead and has hovered on average roughly exactly where she is today when it comes off to the overall net average across the national polls. But it's the, it's the swing states that really do drive most of my interest in these battleground states as to what they are, you know, telling us for the state of the race all across the country. In states like Florida and Arizona and Georgia and Wisconsin, previous battleground states, current battleground states, it all is throwing us for a whirlwind. But I wanted us to explore an electoral college map here that is one that could be very plausible and possibly likely to see on election night this coming November. Now, what we knew from re previous elections is that a lot of states like to vote together. The Rust Belt votes together. Arizona and Nevada vote together. Uh, we started to see the Sun Belt states turn away from certain candidates together. But this time, this map, we might see something very weird and very different that actually seems to be predicted by some of our better pollsters like Quinnipiac University. Today, they released numbers uh, in the states of Georgia and North Carolina. And what did they find? Well, to fast forward to the polling results, they overall said that Georgia has Trump up by seven, North Carolina has Harris up by two. And it's a very fascinating breakdown, but one that I really think gives us this whole understanding of just how random these polls are. It isn't just though those Sunbelt sun states. It also comes down to the battleground states in the Rust Belt. In this poll, you see that Pennsylvania has Harris up by three. Good news on that market alone. But in Michigan, Harris is down three. In Wisconsin, Harris is down two. And so it really is throwing us for a whirlwind because what do we know? Pennsylvania is the state that Trump and Harris are investing the most in, long seen as the most competitive state of the cycle. And yet Harris has a three point lead. And in states like Michigan and Wisconsin, which aren't as targeted by both teams, Trump has an advantage. So it really is quite interesting. Obviously here, you can look at the averages and see Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan are all with democratic advantages. Nevada too would be similar to a 2016 type map. But I want us to explore circumstances like this because they really do stand to show a valid point that maybe some of these battleground states that we previously used to rely on as voting in unison or voting together or swinging in each direction towards a candidate, towards a party, may no longer be the standard case. Of course, to get to this point, what we have to do is characterize all of those safe Democratic states, all of those safe states that we know are going to go in a way that is pretty substantive for the Democratic Party, states like Maine which might not necessarily be a safe red here, a safe blue here, but we're going to see places like Maine's first district. That will be good for the Democratic Party. In Hawaii, that will be good for the Democratic Party. Again, continuing across this platform, 181 electoral votes for the Democratic candidates here. When you move over to the Republicans, they have a considerable portion of electoral votes that they can characterize as safe for them as well. States like North Dakota, states like Missouri, states like Alabama, states like Indiana. It's pretty standard. Again, these are not states that are sh shockingly competitive uh, or shockingly safe. These are all states we have come to know to be strong enough states for the Democratic Party. And so South Carolina, a likely Republican state, Alaska, a likely Republican state, continuing across here, where are we at? Uh, 123 for Donald Trump and J.D. Vance, uh, Kamala Harris, Tim Walls at 181, Nebraska's first, Nebraska at large, those are all safe states, um, trying us to get us to a point where we are, you know, matching all of the uh, numbers here and really can focus on some of these battlegrounds. I don't want to spend too much time talking about states like Iowa and Ohio. These are states that Republicans uh, are going to win. We're going to see Donald Trump win there. We're going to see him win in states like Florida. Uh, these are states that are going to be likely for the Republican Party, not really much to be concerned about uh, on the Democratic side. 
Kamala Harris has her own fair share of likely states too. States like Colorado, states like New Mexico, states like Virginia and New Hampshire and Maine at large and Minnesota. These are all going to be uh, likely Democratic states. Nebraska second also can join that bunch as a likely Democratic state. So here we are, 133 toss-up electoral votes. These are the states that are really going to be down to the wire. And when it comes down to the you know actual electoral odds of Kamala Harris in Texas, I'd say that Texas is going to be you know potentially a likely red state, probably a lean red state right now. I'd go so far at some point in the future depending on how this, these numbers shake, uh, shape up to be looking forward is that Texas might be even better uh, for Donald Trump than it was in 2020, but maybe not right now. I'm more leaning towards maybe not just because that Senate race there, Democrats are investing a lot. We're going to see a very interesting uh, dynamic between Ted Cruz and Colin Alred. Again, not much of a residual effect, um, but you know, anyways, moving past that point, Texas will be a Donald Trump state regardless. Let's focus on these 93 electoral votes. And so when it comes down to, you know, what even is uh, quite weird or unusual about this map, we have to understand that again, what we have known about these states is that they relatively swing together. From the 2020 election, comparing it to 2016, six out of these seven states shifted towards the left. Compared to the 2012 election, seven out of these states or five out of the seven states shifted towards the right. And so really, these elections group in these states together, largely do move in a direction that is beneficial for Democrats, beneficial for Republicans. But what we're going to do is break that down. And what we're going to do is take numbers like these and apply them to an electoral college map. And so what we'd find here is that we would find states like Pennsylvania in favor of Kamala Harris. But Donald Trump would hold that advantage in Wisconsin and Michigan. After all, what that would be is roughly a three-point lead in Michigan and a two-point lead in Wisconsin. And now I'm not saying Quinnipiac is going to be the end-all be-all, but I will say I do think there's a significant chance that Michigan does vote to the right of both Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. And if Michigan is a three-point state, Wisconsin is a red state too. Pennsylvania, the only real reason I could see Harris winning this state if she's losing both of the others, which I don't think is necessarily the most likely outcome. But again, just, just humoring this point here and looking at the data, maybe we're missing the mark to just my own internal predictions here. But Pennsylvania, when we're looking at it, is a state that the Harris and Trump campaigns have invested so incredibly much into the battlegrounds. And I wouldn't be shocked if we saw, you know, uh, you know, Pennsylvania go to Kamala Harris just because of the heavy investments in the state. Trump obviously is trying to match that. But ultimately, you know, again, weird things happen in American politics. This is possible. I do want to humor, though, for a moment. Also, Michigan, I think Michigan could very well be a state that Kamala Harris could win Wisconsin, Kamala Harris could win Pennsylvania, but she could lose Michigan. And I think we've started to see this bleeding pretty consistently since uh, the beginning of the Israel-Palestinian conflict, um, you know, a national presence, right? Obviously, we're going to talk about how this has been something that has been omnipresent for a lot of voters in Dearborn, Michigan, in the Arab American communities, the role of Israel and the United States and foreign aid and all of these things obviously had mattered long before uh, October 7th, 2023. But in looking at what has major uh, has become a major issue for voters in this region across Michigan, across the country, amongst young voters, college voters, all across the board, we have found that this issue was never in the top 10 prior to this election, never in the top 10 prior to October of 2023. And seeing it now becoming this more uh, present uh, uh, present day uh, issue for a lot of voters, you will find that there, in fact, are voters that voted for Gretchen Whitmer, voted for Joe Biden, voted for Whitmer in 18, voted for Clinton, voted for Democrats for decades that will not vote for Harris this election. And that will come largely in states like Michigan. Now, the question is for the Harris campaign, do they have enough support to overcome that, right? You're going to see that there are groups of bases abandoning the Republican Party as well. You've seen it too. The support that Donald Trump has amongst white women has decreased tremendously from 2020 and especially 2016. They were both integral in winning in battleground states in previous elections. They no longer are there in a way that they were in previous elections. And whether that has to do with the Dobbs decision or January 6th or a combination of the two or a combination of a variety of other factors here. Kamala Harris's support, I think, can come through in Pennsylvania and can be lost in Michigan, and it could end up with an electoral map that looks like this, just with Wisconsin being blue, and it wouldn't be too shocking to me, at least, even though it breaks that norm and what we have known about these Rust Belt states and that they have voted together for the past 28 years. Now, moving on to the remaining 49 toss-up electoral votes, let's look at what the data again tells us about the state of the race in these states. Georgia would be a state that Donald Trump apparently would win by seven points. So that actually would be a likely map, but we know that realistically it's not going to be likely, and that Kamala Harris wins North Carolina. It's a very weird electoral map, but it isn't one that is being disproven by this data we're working with. 
And then it brings us down to Arizona and Nevada, where Kamala Harris currently holds that lead in Nevada across the battleground state here, according to 538. But according to 538 as well, Donald Trump holds a narrow advantage in the state of Arizona. And I know this is something that seems very, very weird. I actually do think that a more likely outcome in the map that I'll, I'll solidify here with uh, is one that looks similar to this, where you're going to find, you know, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Arizona, Nevada on the Democratic side, and Wisconsin and Michigan on the Republican side. I know it might be shocking, but it's something that is possible in the modern day and age. Because Kamala Harris's campaign also, too, pointed to North Carolina with much more investments than I think we've seen Democrats thought about doing before and thought they could do in this election when they were largely playing defense in the battleground states. Not to mention, too, when it comes down to Kamala Harris and the base of Democratic voters that she excites the most, you have seen the biggest groups that have seen an increase in enthusiasm are minority voters across the country. There are massive populations of black, brown, uh, you know, Hispanic voters in North Carolina. You've seen this all across the board here where you have found that on every single demographic group, when it comes down to breaking it down by race, every single demographic group, Asian Americans, Black Americans, right? You have seen it all across the board. Increased enthusiasm for Kamala Harris in all of the polling data we have seen since she got to the top of the ticket. And thus, we have seen that voter registration amongst these minority groups has skyrocketed in a way that we have not seen amongst white voters. An enthusiasm jump we have not seen as much amongst white voters. And that's a good thing for Kamala Harris. And it speaks to the point as to why a state like North Carolina might be more probable if polls are missing something or accurately gauging something, according to Quinnipiac, that North Carolina might go to the left of states like Wisconsin and Michigan. Now, I'm not here to defend that this is my own prediction. This is not my prediction. But again, it's an electoral map that I could very well see happening. And I know it might completely break what we have known about elections. But it is something that is possible, something that to consider, something that to think about when you're looking at it from the perspective of, you know, wait a second, are these states that Kamala Harris can win? Are these states that Donald Trump can win? And based on individual data, because everything is within this margin of error, because everything is within this very close and competitive state, uh, you know, state of the nation, we are going to find that many of these battlegrounds can genuinely vote in different directions, different directions, different directions, and break that norm of what we thought we knew about presidential elections across the seven states. And when it comes down to Nevada and Arizona, a big reason why I think Harris could pull out a lead here too while losing one in Wisconsin and Michigan is because of an abortion referendum set to take place in both Nevada and Arizona. Now, Arizona has had a much more robust campaign period surrounding the abortion referendum. A lot of actors on the left and the right have invested millions upon millions of dollars in that state. Nevada is a bit interesting because they have to pass all referenda twice in order for it to make something, uh, you know, a law across uh, a citizen's referenda. In Arizona, it just needs to happen once. And so there's a lot of investment into the state of Arizona on this point, trying to drive out the vote, trying to get people to the ballot box on the issue. And not to say that that isn't happening in the state of Nevada. Both states are exhibiting an abortion referendum that is becoming a very prominent issue for voters in the state, even if it wasn't necessarily before, but especially if it was before. And so looking at states like Nevada and Arizona, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, the only one here that really does shock me a bit is Georgia. But then again, right, some data points have started to show that Kamala Harris is in a better position in North Carolina than she is in Georgia, right? Maybe the most recent numbers might disagree with me on that. But what I've come to know about the race here is that, in fact, this is true. Georgia has a larger lead for Trump than it does for, you know, than it does in uh, North Carolina. And that is really fascinating because Trump lost Georgia in 2020, but won North Carolina. But looking back in 2016, it isn't that shocking because he won Georgia by five points, over five points, actually. North Carolina went to Trump by just under four. And so very different dynamics, but very interesting election regardless. But this is an electoral map that I wouldn't be shocked if I saw on election day. It just genuinely would look pretty bad. Honestly, I love the connecting red and blue. It look, 2004 probably has one of the most, uh, you know, Interesting looking maps because it shows all the connection points between red and blue. And it's really interesting because it, uh, it's quite aesthetically pleasing just by the nature uh, of connection point. I'm getting off on a tangent here. Uh, but this map, this map is one that I think we could be in for. It could be very fascinating. This could be the October, rather November surprise about the election, breaking down what we have thought we knew about these battlegrounds. Donald Trump would be at 260 electoral votes. Kamala Harris would be at 278. And even if you take away one of these states like Nevada, for instance, where Trump swears up and down he's going to win, she would still win the election in this circumstance. I do think, though, uh, based on the polling numbers alone, we would give Arizona to Trump. But I do think we're in a circumstance where Nevada and Arizona can be together. Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania can break apart. And while it may be shocking, it may completely warp your perception about 
Rust Belt politics. It's something that I do think is very much particular to this election, particular to Kamala Harris, and particular to Donald Trump in this set of races. That in future ones, I do imagine they'll come back together. The Sun Belt and the Rust Belt will largely swing together, maybe not necessarily to the same candidates, but overall an electoral map that'll look prettier when it comes down uh, to just aesthetics and connection points uh, across states and across color schemes. But looking at this electoral map, what may shock us today may be our reality tomorrow. And that's something I want us to keep in mind as we look forward to an election that is likely going to come down to the wire and be decided by less than a point in at least four or five of these seven battleground states. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. Make sure to comment down suggestions below. Subscribe on the left if you haven't already and check out the Instagram and Twitter. At the top left of the screen, there's also a Discord server for you to go ahead and join. On the screen, this video you can watch and then a playlist for my 2024 presidential election analysis videos. Again, thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you all later today.